The puzzling and raging debates surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic prompted me to provide a brief discussion on how they relate to all the issues I explore in the courses I teach. Nothing that I can recall has affected what we do and has had such stark relevance to what I teach than this pandemic and the responses to it. My intent with this lecture is that you will continue to think about the points I've made in your class in broader ways, that you will recognize the need for more nuance in the debates that we have at a time where nuance is quickly dismissed at everyone's peril. This will not be our last pandemic or global health crisis where public health, science, and politics will intersect. And as all of you know, I do not believe that biomedical research exists in a vacuum. Unfortunately, the pandemic provides ample evidence of this fact. I'll start with a modest prediction that when this pandemic saga is over, or when we have arrived at a reality we have agreed to live with, the nature of research will have changed, above and beyond the use of digital and remote technologies. We will, and in fact are right now, exploring how to more effectively communicate with patients and the public at large. The suspicion and animosity generated by the mere whisper of a mandate to wear masks should alarm us. If the threat of serious illness or death is not enough to encourage participation in public health efforts, we clearly need new tools to communicate and educate. We may not be able to assume that health preempts all other considerations, at least for a substantial fraction of the population. Now, on a more granular level, I'll make another modest prediction. I look to more medical devices that can turn spare bedrooms, dens, and basements into quasi-hospital rooms. The larger and more general issues that now surround the pandemic will linger for the foreseeable future. The response to the pandemic has become so highly emotional and political for many people in the U.S. that even our most basic approach to public health is being challenged. In fact, the current environment has compelled me to feel the need to choose my words carefully, but it is not out of a concern for political correctness. Let me be clear. I think we should wear masks, practice physical distancing, avoid large gatherings, and wash our hands often. As an aside, I don't like the phrase social distancing and use physical distancing instead. Our political disputes are all too frequently creating social distancing among us, and not in healthy ways. Anyway, I think we should wear masks, practice physical distancing, avoid large gatherings, and wash our hands often. To me, it's just common sense. You cannot negotiate with a virus. And COVID-19 is not like the flu because we have no vaccines and almost nothing to treat the disease itself. Sadly, these last few words ordinarily would not be anything special or extraordinary. But in this climate, words like these could be construed as politically provocative, and that's a sad commentary. So in contemplating this lecture, I was irritated, astonished, disconcerted, dismayed, call it what you may, to even realize that maybe I have to choose my words carefully if I wanted to create some teachable moments. Fortunately, I had a conversation with a very close friend who wondered why Anthony Fauci, the NIH director of the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, has been so measured in the way he presents his thoughts and prescriptions. Isn't it obvious that we need to wear masks, wash our hands, avoid large crowds, and practice physical distancing? After putting aside my exasperation with the truth of my friend's words, I realized that public health officials are trained to deal with public health. And that means all of the public, not just those who agree with us or don't see the danger. And those in public health understand that we will not berate our way into convincing people to put on masks, wash their hands, avoid large crowds, or practice physical distancing, as satisfying as yelling and insulting may feel. That strategy has not gotten us far with the anti-vaccine crowd, and it's not getting us anywhere now. But who could have predicted that such a simple measure as wearing a mask would provoke such outrage in some people? We don't often see this when other medical treatments often require more complicated, lengthy, and painful things of people. So the times speak to a need to talk in ways that continue discussions, not end them, or create winners or losers, or the need to score meaningless rhetorical points. We need a mixture of patience, 
persistence, and goodwill. The pandemic has shown us that our products and therapies will not always be well received by everyone, even if the stakes are life and death or serious illness or ongoing serious conditions. The situation is more than a little frustrating, but it calls for more exploration, not resignation. When it comes to discussing government regulators, I've gone out of my way in my lectures to emphasize that FDA was created under political pressure and is always subject to political pressure, although the agency was created to ensure that medical claims were based in fact, were based in science. On paper, that has seemed straightforward, but the federal government's current strange mix of political and scientific approaches to public health has shown us that even science-based agencies are subject to political pressures. We've just never seen it quite like this. There has always been pressure for FDA to act quickly on products. There is nothing new about that. After all, there is an obvious cost to delay more time that patients suffer or die. This was a situation with HIV-AIDS, as Dr. Fauci knows all too well. The longer we go without a treatment and a vaccine, the more people will die or get seriously ill from COVID-19. But if we go too fast, then we risk providing false hope and injuring even more patients by taking a wrong turn. As important, we risk compromising the credibility of federal research and regulatory activities. So as we race to find a vaccine for COVID-19, we also hear concerns about product development initiatives that may play too loose with safety, efficacy, and quality standards. On the other hand, we see continuous coverage and analysis of every piece of clinical trial data that may be useful. But these reports are headlines, and headlines shortchange nuance. And you already know treatments are all about nuance, and increasingly about nuance in the world of genomics. Add politics to the equation, and we get the worst of all possible worlds. It does not yet appear that vaccine makers are cutting corners when it comes to R&D. What we are hearing is that the federal government is willing to financially underwrite quicker and riskier business decisions to move to phase three trials and into mass production. But we are also starting to hear concerns about companies cutting deals that may be a little too sweet, even under these circumstances. Now, I can't speak to that except to say that it reflects that there is a lot of distrust of institutions and organizations right now. As I frequently tell you, things are rarely simple. But as the federal government talks about a warp speed program for a vaccine, the manufacturers and policymakers, meaning FDA, will have a harder time in trying to take shortcuts on the science. Why? Science still matters in product development because the public needs to have confidence that a vaccine or a treatment will work. We've already run into confusion and angst over the unfounded assertions that prompted the off-label use of chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. And also remember, the rest of the world is dealing with COVID-19 as well. It will be difficult to indefinitely sustain a problematic product or course of action when the rest of the world is watching and reacting to our behavior. Now, not only on a scientific basis, but also on decisions on how to share the vaccine when one is developed. And yet in other ways, for example, the EU is limiting U.S. citizen entry into member countries because of the COVID rates in the U.S. Now, despite all of this, we will get through COVID-19. But the danger, my concern, my fear is that we will no longer feel the proper urgency to save lives to do it, at least not in the short term. We still have a significant fraction of the country that is highly suspicious of vaccines and who will look for any excuse, legitimate or not, to refuse to take such a product. Many are suspicious of government for many and varied reasons. They range from culture warriors to those with long histories of actual abuse at the hands of the medical establishment. So it is important to stop and think about why different segments of the population may be suspicious and reluctant to accept a vaccine in the face of what may seem so obvious to the majority of us. One class of reasons may be that we are in a special time in discussing these kinds of issues. The nation as a whole is starting to accept that there has been systemic racism in the U.S., and that there have been health consequences that stem from these inequities. People of color seem to have higher infection rates, possibly because they are the ones providing essential services now and have not been able to stay home because of economic reasons, and they do not have access to the same kinds of services as others. 
People of color also have had a sad history with organized medicine that goes beyond, unfortunately, the horrors inflicted on the black men who were infected with syphilis and the Tuskegee experiments. But there's more to this that also goes to the prosperity of a community and how retailers feel about serving those communities. A few years ago, I had to change doctors because the one I was seeing had retired. My new doctor learned that I taught at Drexel, and so she asked me what I thought we needed to do about health care. I suspect she expected me to say something about the Affordable Care Act or something about changing regulations or research. What I did tell her was this. If I could do only one thing, I would ensure that every community had access to fresh produce, had access to fresh vegetables and fruit. Initially, she was startled at my answer, but then understood quite clearly what I meant. Good health starts with good nutrition, which means easy access to nutritious foods. And COVID-19 is particularly dangerous to those who already have health problems. And it's not a big leap to go from poor nutrition to health problems. And now, some of you have a better understanding of why I asked you to explain the differences among food, supplements, OTCs, and prescription drugs. It was not just an idle question. You know, I'm also thinking the societal recognition of racial and ethnic inequities will generate greater attention to the way we recruit clinical trial subjects and the diversity of the clinical trial population in terms of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic factors. And I just don't think it will be a stretch to see clinical trial management increasingly assessed at the beginning of a study on the basis of the diversity of those clinical trial populations. I also would venture to say that that we will see more attention to decisions as to which subpopulations are studied after a drug is approved as part of phase four studies, as opposed to being studied up front. Now also remember that when we talk about public health or population health, We are also talking about areas that help inform decisions on what products to create and for whom. COVID-19 obviously calls for the development of treatments and vaccines, but early indications show other needs for related conditions. For example, there is evidence that the virus is particularly dangerous for those with diabetes, and that speaks to nutrition and general well-being, and again circles back and implicates racial and socioeconomic inequities in society. The virus also attacks those with respiratory problems, which could prompt new products to treat those types of conditions in the new world of COVID-19. So public health and population health are not divorced from our world of clinical trials. They help inform our next development moves. And if a significant portion of the population is in denial about the virus or refuses to listen to medical advice, then the biomedical product companies can be expected to develop or at least examine the market for products that meet the health needs of that population. It is a cold, hard truth that if enough people make poor decisions on a health issue or simply have bad luck, medical product makers will try to meet the need, not to mention the scam artists. Now, we do similar things now in dealing with opiate addiction and cigarette smoking, so don't be too shocked. And not to be too harsh, but this is what may go for compassion in a free market system. Now, others take the position that COVID-19 has to be considered the cost of doing business. They don't wish anyone any harm or that they get sick. But if someone does, well, we have to go sometime. And the economic costs of shutting down the economy mean we are being harmed in other ways. The shutdowns delay other medical procedures, increase depression, increase stress, and make it difficult for people to support their families. In my view, they're mistaken in seeing fighting the pandemic versus opening business as a strictly binary choice. It is even more puzzling when wearing a mask would be one way to reopen larger swaths of the nation. I'm not going to respond to these arguments against wearing masks or physical distancing or avoiding crowds. I'm not looking for an argument in any case. I'm in search of a discussion, or better yet, a large series of discussions that help persuade people to see the risks and opportunities more clearly, to see that wearing a mask is a sign of mutual respect for others, not a political statement. Yelling at them is not a good tactic for persuading them to change their behavior or attitudes. My desire for these kinds of discussions, in fact, is not far from what we hope for when we test other biomedical products so that people feel comfortable or actually seek out the products that we help develop and test. We don't see people often argue about getting a treatment for a specific disease that they suffer from or do any number of unpleasant things in getting treatment for cancer. 
or in fact even wearing a mask when asked to in a hospital. But we do see people often reject treatments as well. Maybe not worth the cost of the quality in life for the remaining time that they do have, or out of concern for bankrupting their families, or out of religious conviction, or for any number of reasons too numerous to list. The outcry, if there is one in these instances, is usually confined to family and friends. Sometimes, however, such decisions do become incredibly public and political, most notably when the issues involve reproductive rights or the right to die. But it's the collective nature of a pandemic's effects that makes the difference here. Our actions or inactions directly affect everyone else in this pandemic era. So the public health response and biomedical product process have the potential to be turned into political battles. And so they have this year. And in this election year, we are confronted with two distinct political choices on how to confront public health issues. And the outcome will affect the choices we make in biomedical R&D. Now, I'm not trying to lead you to any conclusions here. The point of this whole discussion has been to simply try to paint a larger picture to help you clarify your own thinking about how science, medicine, and politics interact in our field. So with that, please be well and stay safe.